let me call upon stage all the dignitaries for this session mr c padma kumar co chairman of prima 2020 also calling mr arun kumar chairman and ceo ceo of kpmg also ca h vinod senior vice president tma also mr mr subramanian vice president of tma on to the dais ladies and gentlemen we do have all the dignitaries on stage for the valedictory session can we have a round of applause for them for the introduction may i call upon to the dais once again mr c padma kumar co chairman of prima 2020 our chief guest uh, of the valedictory function mr arun kumar chairman and ceo of kpmg mr vinod senior vice president tma mr mr subramanian vice president tma mr rajesh ja president dr saudullah chairman of the organizing committee past presidents tma members delegates and friends when we started the discussions about um, prima 2020 5 months ago i think uh, it was when we started we didn't have a, too much of an idea about you know the kind of subject that we would be discussing and after a couple of rounds of meetings we eventually agreed upon the subject that you have all been listening to for the last day and a half frankly we didn't envision that um, this would be so topical so relevant and that it would uh, produce the kind of discussion and debate that we've seen yesterday and today we're also very uh, pleased with the kind of um, turnout that we've seen the number of delegates that who have come and attended the uh, session which is i think um, you know uh, extremely encouraging and also tells us that we need to spread the word of professional management much further and much wider while we did have a good mix of people in the audience today i i believe that um, you know considering the proximity of uh, techno park we could do with um, large number of people from that um, uh, you know large conglomeration of industries it industries and i'm sure that um, we will see a much greater participation next year we have a summing up session coming up so i'm not going to uh, even try and uh, get into the actual deliberations that happened during the conference i hope that um, the conference has lived up to your expectations and that if there have been any um you know little missteps please do take the trouble to point them out to us and we will make sure that we correct them and uh, next year trima 2021 will be even better before i uh, go on to the pleasant task of introducing the chief guest and welcoming him to deliver the Uh, address i thought i should just make one point and also uh, suggest it as something for the trivandrum management associations managing committee to consider in the last session uh, there was an animated uh, q and a and the last one i think was involved uh, the gentleman vinod from asap so it it looks like a kind of chicken and egg situation you know who's going to make the first move is it going to be industry or is it going to be the government mr vk matthews is very clear that government must make the first move you know invite industry to come and participate so i was thinking instead of uh, leaving it to either of them why doesn't tma take the initiative and be the <coughs> bridge and i think this is the kind of thing that organizations like uh, tma and ca and all should be doing so i would just like to place this for the uh, attention of the president and the managing committee 
And now let me move to my uh, pleasant task of uh, introducing our chief guest, Mr. Arun Kumar. Mr. Arun M. Kumar, Chairman and CEO of KPMG in India, is an accomplished global executive with experience spanning multiple sectors from high technology to government and many geographies from Silicon Valley to India. Prior to this current role, Mr. Arun Kumar served in a sub-cabinet position in the Obama administration as the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Global Markets and Director General of the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service. He oversaw a team located in 78 countries and all the 50 states of the U.S., led trade missions and engaged in commercial diplomacy and advocacy worldwide on behalf of U.S. government and industry. Before his tenure in public service, Mr. Arun Kumar was a partner and member of the Board of Directors at KPMG LLP. He led the firm's West Coast management consulting practice, serving major global clients as well as emerging Silicon Valley ventures. Prior to this, he was a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, a founding CEO and CFO of three technology ventures. Over the years, he has been a mentor and advisor to a number of new ventures in Silicon Valley and India. Mr. Arun Kumar is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations New York. He chairs the India Advisory Council of the U.S.-India Business Council. An early charter member of Thai Silicon Valley, he has been associated with Thai in the U.S. and India. Mr. Arun Kumar has authored a book of poetry, Plain Truths, in 2010, and co-edited a book, Kerala's Economy, Crouching Tiger, Sacred Cows. This was in 2007. Mr. Arun Kumar has written and ex spoken extensively on trade and business topics, most recently at the Nikkei International Management Forum. He has been a participant at the WF India and WEF East Asia sessions, the latter during his tenure with the U.S. administration. Current topics of interest are responses to the U.S.-China trade war as well as the global infrastructure imperative, OBOR, and the Indo-Pacific paradigm. I thought I should also share a couple of personal anecdotes and footnotes. Mr. Arun Kumar went to the same school that I did, the Lawrence School in Updale, and uh, he is a uh, winner of the President's Medal, which is the most prestigious uh, you know, honor that the school bestows on the best outgoing student. Also, when our company, Penpol as it was known at the time and now Terumo Penpol, was fast going downhill and practically bankrupt, it was thanks to advice from Arun that the company survived. So these are little known things which uh, uh, he generally does not advertise but I thought I should mention this. So thank you very much for ex accepting our invitation to be here, uh, Arun and uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Let's welcome Mr. Arun Kumar, Chairman and CEO of KPMG for the address by Chief Guest. Uh, good afternoon, friends. Kumar, thank you for that very kind introduction. I am uh, delighted to be here with you in Trivandrum. Uh, Trivandrum is where I spent some of the best of my growing up years at the University College. I was lucky there to have inspiring mentors and teachers and wonderful classmates, uh, some of whom are still among my closest friends. I grew up here at the advent of the 70s when we were at the beginnings of a recognition that there would be an information revolution that would be as important as the industrial revolution. At that time, there was perhaps just one computer in all of Kerala, and that was a Russian-made Minsk device at the Space Research Center. Today, each of us carries in our pockets at least one computer, a mobile phone that has computing capacity that is over 100,000 times that of that lone Minsk computer. Indeed, the fourth industrial revolution is well upon us. Industry 4.0 is a trifecta of global technological forces that are transforming our world and how people transact with each other in ways that we are only now beginning to comprehend. Three trends are impacting 
nearly every aspect of our lives. One, nearly 70% of the world's population now possesses unprecedented personal processing power, storage capacity, and instantaneous access to knowledge and networks. I mentioned the mobile phone. Two, along with ubiquitous connectivity, we are amid the big data revolution, the ability that we now possess to collect, curate, and utilize what has been called a tsunami of data. And there were references to this in the previous session. And a third major trend has been the recent technological breakthroughs in realms like artificial intelligence, robotics, Internet of Things, quantum computing, and machine learning. There is another cultural and behavioral paradigm shift that is taking place in parallel with these transformative technologies, especially in the younger cohort of the population, namely the millennials. The ability to convene consumers, assets, and data together via the internet and the mobile phone has created the sharing or on-demand economy in realms ranging from transportation to habitation. We see this in the recent popularity of Uber and Airbnb or the food delivery apps. These disruptions are creating new opportunities and powerful tools to handle complex challenges in nearly, nearly every arena of human behavior. The use of big data culled from, the, from implanted IoT devices can facilitate cost-effective innovation in the use of natural resources like water for irrigation or energy for pumping water. AI has the potential to radically transform areas such as healthcare using techniques like nonlinear analysis, probabilistic interpretation, and dynamic reasoning. Predictive analytics can improve safety thresholds in public infrastructure while enabling economies of use. Facial recognition technologies can simplify process barriers for travelers, enhance security levels in financial interchanges, and ease government to citizen transactions. On the supply side as well, Industry 4.0 is transforming the ways in which production or value creation is organized. Products and services can now be tailor-made to serve the needs of individual customers while preserving the upsides of mass production at scale. For instance, garment manufacturers can produce bespoke clothes for every single buyer using data and machine learning. The ability to spot and to be ahead of trends, along with agility and responsiveness, is becoming a critical determinant of success in today's marketplace. Hierarchical organization structures and the production line approach of the past are being replaced by flat teams that can quickly mutate in tune with rapidly evolving requirements. Organizations are becoming thinner in terms of their own staffing, relying on a web of suppliers of services. A recent study has revealed that in the United States, around 90% of net new jobs in the past five years were created by gig workers, independent contractors, and on-call workers who were not on the rules of the company. Talent is becoming increasingly consequential in proportion to capital as a factor of production and robotics and AI are displacing human endeavor and repetitive skills across sectors. Studies conducted by the World Economic Forum have predicted that up to 50% of current tasks and skills will be replaced by AI, that nearly two-thirds of children who start school now will go on to jobs that don't exist yet. While the jury is still out on the types of skills and the proportion of the existing workforce that will be displaced by AI, it is clear that while certain capabilities will be well rewarded, many of the existing skills could be replaced by machines. One of the policy remedies to handle this great skills transition has been the suggestion to introduce universal basic income for all, unrelated to anyone's situation or entitlements. This suggestion has recent been wide, recently been widely debated in India as well, and it is something that Kerala, with a strong tradition of social security, could contemplate for managing disruptions caused by the new wave of technologies. The fourth industrial revolution is hence 
replete with opportunities that we are only now beginning to comprehend. So what are the implications for a state like Kerala? A new moment for Kerala is potentially here, as its knowledge economy can take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution. Kerala today has the ingredients and a tremendous opportunity to build on its favorable socio-economic base to become the next economic powerhouse of India. As is well known, Kerala's welfare-oriented development model has resulted in high literacy and quality of life indicators comparable to developed countries. But alongside, and this is not often highlighted as much as it should be, Kerala has made progress on economic growth and financial indicators. According to the Kerala Economic Review 2019, the state registered 7.5% growth, which was higher than the country's growth rate. The Economic Review also noted the growing share of manufacturing to the state's GDP at 13.2%, which was an uptick of 35% since 2013-14. Kerala's share of manufacturing in India grew from 1.2% in 2014 to 1.6% in 2018 19 and this was during a period when the share of manufacturing in the national GDP continued to decline. Furthermore, the state's per capita income is 60% above the national average today, which is a strong base to build upon. But while Kerala has sustained decent levels of growth, is it enough? Many states are outperforming Kerala on the growth front. A major drawback of economic growth in Kerala today is not is that it is not generating adequate jobs to meet the expectations of educated Keralites entering the labor markets. Alongside employment generation, how can Kerala make the best use of the fourth industrial revolution to further improve the quality of lives and equip its young demographic to take the best advantage of such a rapidly evolving environment? In this context, it must be noted that Kerala is a pioneering state in four key domains that are vital to meeting these challenges. A proactive policy environment, creating the right ecosystem for AI startups to flourish, catalyzing pioneering sectoral applications, and revamping the skilling ecosystem. On policy initiatives, Kerala has been the first state in the country to formulate a policy for the development of technological startups. Kerala's startup village as, was, as, as well as India's largest hardware incubator, the Maker Village, are becoming frontline models for the country. The state government recently declared that Kerala has over 2,200 startups and 230 innovation and entrepreneurship cells, leveraging Industry 4.0, an astonishing number for a small state like Kerala. An entrepreneurship support system is also active and extended support to both 1,100 entrepreneurs in the past year. I mean, these are all very exciting stories of Kerala that are not really well understood. On account of these forward-looking policies, Kerala today does have a robust startup ecosystem with more than 100 IoT labs in its engineering colleges. The state now possesses a specialized biotech instrumentation platform called BioNest, as well as India's first international accelerator for hardware called Brink. In addition, Technopark, which was set up in 1995 to provide support for the development of high technology industries, today provides direct employment to some 70,000 employees and indirect employment to another 150,000. Amongst Kerala cities, Kochi and Trivandrum continue to attract the majority of the startup companies and Code Code is also developing as a hub. Given the complexity, the range, and the fragility of Kerala's natural setting, as well as the state's vulnerability to climate change-induced events, the application of technologies like AI and IoT have become imperative in sectors like focused agriculture, just-in-time irrigation, integrated water management, disaggregated power generation, and healthcare. In the realm of governance, given the attainment of universal education, Technologies like predictive analytics can be deployed to improve welfare and public health interventions for vulnerable sections of society. In this context, I am pleased and honored to share that KPMG has been working 
closely with the state government to assist in implementing the Rebuild Kerala initiative for recreating and rebuilding key infrastructure in the aftermath of the twin floods that devastated the state. What really is exciting is the opportunity to introduce AI, IoT, and big data solutions into this effort in the bid to create resilient as well as intelligent infrastructure that can communicate, consequently lowering maintenance costs, ensuring greater safety, and promoting economy of use. Kerala exports talent to the world, as is well known, with nearly 3 million people working overseas, and around 36% of the GDP in the state constitutes, is constituted by overseas remittances. It is imperative for Kerala to completely revamp its skilling ecosystem for succeeding generations to be in a good place vis-à-vis -vis the requirements of the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution indeed calls for nothing short of a revamping of the skilling ecosystem. One of the first requirements there is to collapse the barriers between specialized skilling institutions like the ITIs and the ITCs, universities and industry. The legacy paradigm of training institutions, preparing courses, anticipating the needs of industry, and then supplying graduates annually may no longer suffice. And this was alluded to in one of the previous sessions. In this new era, skilling can no longer be episodic or modular, and we must embrace a new paradigm of flexible, customized, and contextual lifelong learning. This means that all the players, skilling institutions, communities, and firms have to work together as a coalition. Moreover, skilling delivery models can be asset light, transmitting learning and skills even remotely through media like the mobile phone. I was pleased to meet an entrepreneur today who has a, a project here that addresses broadly this area of matching skills, educational institutions, and industry. We can creatively deploy Industry 4.0 instruments to prepare our workforce for value creation. For instance, we can use big data analytics to identify trends in evolving skilling requirements and matching these with corresponding skill gaps in the workforce. In other words, using AI to get the workforce AI ready. There are two other disruptive trends that we need to be prepared for. Increasing price arbitration arising from the ease with which skills and work can be delivered remotely to clients worldwide, and the rising popularity of what is called gig working, where services are increasingly delivered to firms exogenously and not by staff on the payroll. Both these trends will raise the bar for the efficient delivery of high-quality skills. The complacency that we have traditionally associated with being comfortably settled in a lifelong job within the hierarchy of a firm is becoming a thing of the past. Let me conclude by saying that Kerala, for Kerala, the key lies in embracing agility and change in this new world of rapid flux and innovation. Kerala is making strides in seizing these new opportunities, and capturing this opportunity is vital for securing a better future for the state. I want to compliment the Trivandrum Management Association for the energy and the focus which they have brought to the critical aspects of Industry 4.0 and skilling and its increasing importance to Kerala. I look forward to Kerala's transformation into one of the leading states in the country in the area of Industry 4.0. Thank you. From the Institute of Management in Kerala University Karivatam campus, Najla Nasir and Ritu Rexi. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to the very talented youngsters from Institute of Management in Kerala. Respected officials and colleagues, a very good evening to one and all present here. I am Najla Nasir and this is my partner Ritu Rexi from Institute of Management Kerala. We are here to showcase a small presentation on the topic, employee engagement in organizations. Let's move on to the overview. Okay, now we have the overview. Organizations need to execute functional strategy and engage employees optimally to achieve increased and sustainable business results in today's business environment. And for that, for obtaining optimal productivity, it is essential to fully engage employees by creating favorable work environment advantages to both the employer and the employees. 
Moving on to the next session, that is the categories of employees, which we can't unsee. The first one is engaged and committed employees. These are the best workers of the organization. And next we have committed employees who just want to work for a living. Engaged employees who shows a dedication towards the work. And finally, the disengaged employees who shows a kind of disinterest towards the work. Now let us have a recapitulation of Maslow's hierarchy of employee engagement, which is self-explanatory. Moving on to the objectives, there are certain objectives, exactly six of them, which are the main points that we need to notice. The first one is align employees with the organizational goals and values, employee productivity, enhance employees' sense of well-being, employee motivation, understand the attitudes of your employees, improve workplace conditions that promote the engagement. We have certain areas where employee engagement has wider scope, and those are organization, productivity, and organizational performance. So in the organization, we have meaningfulness, safety, and availability, which needs to be noted. The next one is the productivity, where we have people-focused policies, organizations, culture and productivity, organizational performance. Now, finally, we have employee retention, employee performance, commitment and motivation, superior quality, higher profits, and productivity, which is included in the organizational performance. Now, next is the factors influencing employee manage engagement. And this, not even one person in this hall would not be here which are not familiar with these words. These, these are recruitment and selection, training and development, career development opportunities, leadership position, equal and fair opportunities, performance appraisal, incentives, and compensation. We all are familiar with this. Now we have a real life example, which is the Tata Consultancy Services. Here, the employees at TCS are provided with perks such as free refreshments, paid holidays, accelerated promotions, awards, and rewards. And because of this, it opens an appreciation of known work-related projects, boosts creativity, and enhances their morale and ultimately the company's productivity. Now, finally, there's a relation of human capital management and employee engagement, and there are three points to be noted. The, those are onboarding, internet or self-service tools, performance management, and feedback tools. By this, we are concluding our presentation. Thank you, TMA and uh, Trima Organizing Committee for giving us this opportunity to showcase our talent. And uh, uh, special thanks to uh, uh, Colonel Arjun Nayasa for uh, motivating us to do so. Thank you all. Wonderful presentation. Congratulations to winners and thank you. And so for summing up this, may I call upon stage Sri C.A. C C H. Vinod, Senior Vice President of TMA. Good evening, everyone. Our convention, Walk in a Changing World, A Vision for Kerala, is concluding. My job is to sum up this session. Since all the sessions were outstanding and excellent, my job became very difficult. Anyway, for those who have missed yesterday's events. Our convention started with the inaugural function and Rajesh Shah, President of TMA, welcomed the audience and guests. He briefly explained about our theme, Walk in a Changing World. This was followed by the concept presentation by Dr. Sagadullah, Chairman of Trima Committee. He explained the concept in a brief and lucid manner, highlighting about the disruptive technology, the positive effects of technology in health sector, unemployability in medical professionals and the statistics he presented was really a surprise to many, around 7,000 in Kerala. He also stressed on the medical front to adapt to the recent changes in technological world. This was followed by keynote address by Heyman Naruka, Director Adani Enterprises and past president of AIMA. He made a PowerPoint presentation highlighting very valid points made an elaborate and clear presentation on the employee concept in the changing world, stress for a need of harm harmonious work environment. With the technological changes, new trends and av avenues are opening up in the new, new market. For today's employee, monetary benefit is not the only motivation factor in joining or continuing in a job. That was a good point that can be taken from his presentation. 
Then the convention was inaugurated by Honorable Governor of Kerala Sri Arif Muhammad Khan. He took the audience through a scholarly talk covering the theme of our convention. His speech was cemented on the quotes of Mahatma Gandhi and various religious scripts. He reminded us all, reminded us all that learning is a matter of survival in this new world. The, le the real learning starts from life experience and schools and universities teach us only how to learn. He presented a scenario saying that around 75, about 75 million jobs become obsolete by 2022. At the same time, as many as 133 million new jobs will be, will be created. And this calls for constant learning and skill updation. It's no doubt has his inaugural address really helped, helped us in starting this convention in an elegant manner. Because while leaving the hall, I think he complimented our president saying that this is a very elegant function. Inaugural function ended with mementos being presented to Honorable Governor and Heman Neruka by TMA Secretary Sri Mahesh. The inaugural session was soon followed by our first technical session which was Industry 4.0. This session was moderated by Sri Vijay Raghavan. After introducing the panelists in his unique style, he introduced the subject to the audience. His introduction reminded us about the dynamic changes that is going to take place in the next 10 years. He also highlighted on a better and more governance due to technological changes. This was followed by a mind-blowing power presentation by Sri Somnath, Director of VSSC. He presented the future vision of the world on the background of transformation technology. Several takeaways were there in his PowerPoint presentation. To summarize a few, computers will become an integral part of human life. Artificial intelligence will redefine the world by rewriting procedures and protocols. Even the technique of studying is going to change in future. He stressed that India needs to move much forward on control population, access the modern tech giving access to modern technology to the youth, access to food and water. He also very elaborated very widely on the IoT, Internet of Things. Industry 4.0 is based on automated robots, simulations, industrial IoT, etc. He also touched upon the space industry and small, small satellite production. Panelists, con panelists of the session contribute their knowledge and experience and answered many queries from the audience in the open forum at the end of the session. Sri Saji Gupta highlighted the three essentials of knowing, doing, and reading. Sri Radha Krishnan Naya stressed on the multidisciplinary knowledge in the virtual era. More people will get benefited by the technology change. Sri Madhya Sudhamani explained the latest technological drives undergoing in the health sector of government of Kerala that is moving towards one person on electronic record. She also elaborated on the healthcare reforms. Today we started with the first session of Able to Capable, moderated by Mr. Subhash. And he, in a very eloquent manner, dwelt upon saying that the business is moving from complicated to more complex situation. Industrial revolution will lead to radical changes in the educational system. Upskilling up, up should start from the top to the bottom of the organization. Keynote address was given by Mr. Jedin, head of Adani Skill Development Center. He actually started his presentation in a humorous manner with a photograph which depicted the concept of decoding of instructions by the employee or workforce. A concept, is, a concept which is very relevant, equally relevant in industry as well as in bureaucracy. Manufacture should be a combination of machine learning and data analysis was a highlight of his observation. The panelists for these sessions were Alexander Vergis, COO, UST, Shekharan Vai Menon and Kripesh Hariharan. Alexander Vogis emphasized on the collaboration of industrial bodies, government and academics, stressed on the need for upskilling and adopting latest technological, in, technological innovations. Shekharan Vai Menon stressed on the relevance of educational system for pro providing applicational knowledge to the graduates. He also dealt upon the current educational system. Kripesh Hariharan focused on the recent changes in health sector, also emphasizing the importance of hospitality in health sector. After that, it was followed by a very short talk by the NGO Kandari. And in the literal sense of that word Kandari, it was a Kandari experience to our thoughts and attitude. 
I don't have to add more to that. It was a real experience for all of you. This was followed by the third technical session moderated by Sri T.P. Srinivasan. He talked about his experience in reforming the higher education system, advised he advised that he advised against innovative and radical changes to the ex existing education system. Most of should be instead given to educational infrastructure, teachers training, technology and research, autonomy and international access. Keynote address was given by Bain Lee. She made a good PowerPoint presentation with a lot of valid points to take a few. Learning should be given more importance, mobilization of resources, change in mindset of people needed. She elaborated on the concept of artificial intelligence also. The panelists of the session were Dr. P.S. James, Director, Asian School of Business, Anubama Raj, Raju, UST Global, Hira Nair, Konix. And they had a very vibrant discussion with some very valid takeaways like, we have technology, we have people, but humanity is missing. Knowing, doing, and being are the three aspects of adaptability to learn. And the importance of emotional caution highlighted, importance of achievement orientation also highlighted. And one of the other valuable takeaway about that, technology is not going to kill the language. Language will exist. Creativity is, creativity is needed to inspire and innovate. And with that, we came to the last relevant session on Business Connect. It was very relevant in the present, uh, just over. I think everything will be very fresh on you. Many takeaways were there. Disruption is a reality. And uh, our preparedness to face disruption is really questionable. That, that means, are we really prepared to take on that is the question that the panelists threw to us. Then that was followed by a PowerPoint, um, uh, keynote address by Dr. Velimani, which was very inspiring as well as motivational one. He dwelt upon many subjects, but some of these like don't start a business just for making money, it is to generate employment. And his views on women empowerment were very strong and well taken by the audience. Tony Thomas talked about the in, in, uh, industrial 4.0 aspect regarding manufacturing sector. Thomas, Mo, Thomas John Muthu talked about on financial sector, technolo technological advancement in banking sector. And Thania Rajendran took up the media and her observation on no democracy will work or work vibrantly if the media is not properly funded is well taken. And Media industry must remain independent to ensure a consistent democracy. And Sunil Gupta also gave us very valuable observation on problem solving skill, adaptability, critical thinking, mental ability, etc. The skills which are at present required very much for the person workforce. Data scientists and data analysts are the uh, major, have to play a major role in the upcoming changes. These are the brief summary of the events, and I also. I thank everyone for attending this conference. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the summary of Prima 2020 by the Senior Vice President of TMA, C.A.H. Vinod. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. And now, before me, we move on to the official word of thanks, we do have something very memorable happening now. We do have a token of love and gratitude towards uh, our chief guest, that is Mr. Arun Kumar, who is the chairman and CEO of KPMG. To present this memento, may I call upon stage Sri Rajesh Cha, president of TMA. Thank you, sir. And now let's move on to the official vote of thanks. That will be done by the Vice President of TMA, Mr. M. R. Subramanian. Mr. Arun Kumar, Chairman and CEO of KPMG. Mr. Padma Kumar, Co-Chairman, Trima 2020. Mr. Vinod, Senior Vice President, TMA. Dignitaries and Delegates of Trima 2020. Good evening to all of you. As we have come to the close of Trima 2020, it is my pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of TMA to all those who have helped to make this event a grand success. In the beginning, I would like to thank the Honorable Governor of Kerala, Sri Arif Mohammed Khan, 
for accepting our uh, invitation and inaugurating Trima 2020 yesterday evening. He has provided us his valuable advice and directions to Trima to scale up its services to the uh, Trivandrum fraternity. I would also like to uh, record our sincere appreciation to Dr. M.I. Saudullah, Chairman Trima 2020, Mr. Rajesh Jha, President TMA, Mr. C. Padma Kumar, Co-Chairman TMA, our office staff and uh, manager, Mr. Mukesh, and each and every member of Trima Organizing Committee for their valuable efforts and inputs to make Trima 2020 a grand success. We are also grateful to all the sponsors of Trima 2020. We are also thankful to all the speakers and moderators of the various sessions we had during the last two days. We are also thankful to the media, the Hotel Tamara team, the event managers for the excellent support extended to TMA. Thanking you and looking forward to meeting you all of you for Trima 2021. Thank you. That was a sincere word of thanks from the Vice President of TMA, Mr. M.R. Subramanian. Thank you, sir. And thus we have come to the end of the eventful Trima 2020. Thank you, everyone, for being here. See you next year for Trima 2021. Thank you, everyone. See you next year.